Now, cryptocurrency is riding a new wave. Unlike in 2017, this time, it seems like the momentum is carried by institutional players instead of mostly retail traders. Can cryptocurrencies be the safe haven for investors in this digital age? Here to explore the possibilities is moderator Dante Desparte, Vice Chairman, Head of Policy and Communications at Libra Association, now rebranded to Diem. Joining him are the Winklevoss brothers, Cameron and Tyler. Both brothers head up Gemini Trust Company as president and chief executive officer, respectively. Gemini is a cryptocurrency exchange and custodian and is a well-known name in the growing cryptocurrency community. So let's head on over for a deeper dive into cryptocurrency together with Dante, Cameron and Tyler. So who better than Tyler and Cameron Winklevoss to try to reconcile what has been not only a turbulent year for the entire world between a blend of macroeconomic un uncertainty, the COVID-19 pandemic, an enormous strain on all systems um, have relied uh, almost exclusively on the internet as a form of business and operational continuity, but who better to reconcile this, uh, this fateful year than uh, Tyler and Cameron Winklevoss. So it's great to see the two of you again. We've got to stop meeting in this format. Um, and wanted to try to get a read as we look at um, the cusp of 2021 and the likelihood that Bitcoin yet again is on track to breaking a $20,000 ceiling. Um, you've made some very bold predictions um, in this space, but I want to just start by maybe getting some opening reflections from the two of you. Um, and then have a spirited conversation about the direction of travel around the world, the future of money, virtual assets, crypto assets, and how Gemini, under your leadership, has has navigated uh, the storms. So maybe, Tyler, if we could start with you, um, just to kind of get your sense of uh, how things are looking, the direction of travel uh, in the space. Yeah, thanks for having us, Dante. Great to meet again. Um, you know, the the story of 2020 has definitely been the pandemic, um, but I think it's also been Bitcoin. Um, much of the ways that governments around the world have had to respond to the pandemic and the demand economic shock that the lockdowns have caused, um, those tools such as spending, uh, money printing to get us out of that um, has really put into question what the value is of fiat currencies around the world. Um, the debt to GDP ratios are very high in the U.S. It's 135 percent. Um, the highest point before that, when we measured, was 121 percent during World War II. Um, but back then, that we had full employment. Uh, we were building a lot of uh, infrastructure for the, uh, the sorry, um, the the um, you know the war, and. Um, so, but now we have record uh, unemployment. So it's a very different um, situation and um, Bitcoin and hard assets like, um, like gold are your hedge to this inflation. So um, yeah, I think that's sort of the pandemic is obviously the story, but it's very much been a catalyst for Bitcoin. So um, sort of pass to Cameron. Yeah, so so I mean, with that as as a segue, I I didn't want to open up with the, you know the bold article that the two of you co-authored. Uh, you know, the direction of travel for Bitcoin, looking at uh, five hundred thousand dollars, if not potentially more. And it seems not only is this vindicating of your early bets in the space and and Gemini's early bets in the space, which we'll get into as well um, around how you've navigated compliance and trust in digital assets more generally. But you know, I would like to also you know. Cameron, give you a chance to say a few words at the outset in terms of, you know, digital assets and crypto assets being a silver lining in the clouds, and then this long-range bet that both of you have made so um, ably in in your op-ed. Um, you know, how, how do you see things playing out here, and is this the beginning of a of a real transition in terms of the economy? Yeah, no, happy to respond to that, and thanks so much for for having us. Um, it's great to talk to you, Dante. Um, I think Tyler really said it well and laid it up. Um, obviously, there's been a tremendous amount of money printing going on, both in the U.S. and in fiat regimes around the world. Um, and I think that you know, Bitcoin and hard money is a really interesting alternative. Um, I think there's a lot of people that are worried about 
um, the scourge of inflation or the specter of inflation out there. Um, and when those things arise, historically, people tend to look at things like uh, gold um, or, or you could store your, your value in the market, but that will really keep place, pace with inflation and get priced with, um, with that. Um, but really, how do you outrun inflation and what is, what is the classic hedge? And that has historically been gold. And now we have this really cool new asset called Bitcoin um, that basically shares all the properties of gold, but actually like beats it in, in um, a number of different places. For example, uh, I'll start with um, the supply of gold is uh is is scarce but actually two-thirds of gold above ground gold has been mined since 1950 and so technology improves or demand increases or the price of gold goes up enough where people will find gold in different ways and that's similar to how we've managed to find a lot more oil over the past couple of decades mm -hmm with uh, technological advancements like fracking um, and what have you. And, and today the, uh, the US is actually a oil net exporter, which most people never thought would be the case. Um, we thought that you know, the US would be, would be a importer. Um, whereas the supply of Bitcoin is, is truly fixed at 21 million. So it's like gold, but actually better than gold. Um, and also it's a lot more portable. It's very hard to move gold in the middle of a pandemic um, when everything seizes up or locks down and, and Bitcoin really works like email. Um, so there's a lot of really cool properties that we think make Bitcoin an emergent store of value that eventually overtakes gold. And that's how we got to that kind of crazy number of $500,000 per coin. Um, looking at the market cap of gold at 9 trillion, if you look at the market cap today of, of uh, Bitcoin, I think it's around 330, 40 trillion dollars. Um, that would have to grow about 40 times from today's prices to uh, overtake gold. So I would say we're somewhat vindicated uh, in a way, or, or, or it's playing out, um, but we're still like actually only 1 40th of the way there, if we're right. Um, but it's been really exciting to see Bitcoin kind of get back to where it was three years ago, or just under uh, 20,000, which is the previous high. Um, so a lot of people are saying we're in a bull run, and actually, it, we don't think it in many ways has actually started, um, which is pretty exciting. And uh, if you look at the Google searches for the word Bitcoin, it's actually still pretty flat, which means that a lot of the people accumulating Bitcoin um, are people that are sort of doing it quietly, uh, more sophisticated investors who are, are doing sort of research on the asset, uh, looking around at the macro environment and saying, this doesn't add up, this doesn't work. Okay, how do I protect my value uh, from that? And a lot of uh, people who historically would go to gold are starting to look at Bitcoin. It's a it's a fascinating it's a fascinating set of comparisons. And you know, in some of my early reading, writing, and analysis of the space, I've often sort of made this analogy that if data is the new oil, blockchain is the new barrel, and that in that domain you, you have these this new set of industries being born. Um, and another comparison that you know, just to kind of riff off of what you were saying, Cameron is, is um, you know, in so many ways, digital assets in the crypto asset world is to finance what renewable energy is to, to the traditional energy space, right? That um, they're not necessarily producing threats to the system, that in so many ways they're completing the system. And I know, you know, as you two were building Gemini, um, you know, at a time when most regulators, most compliant officials, compliance officials and policymakers might have misunderstood the asset class, as a form of circumvention of rules and money laundering requirements and the rest, you ran to a very high regulatory standard um, in New York, beginning, you know, in, beginning New York, and I know you're expanding to other jurisdictions around the world. And it's only what a 10 year run that we're talking about for the whole space, less than a 10 year run, and there's high expectations here. How do you see, you know, the next wave coming? What are the required breakthroughs to unlock this 500,000? number that you're describing, but more generally speaking, all of the other corners of finance, payments, the movement of value and money, um, we still labor today. And we saw that clearly in the United States and around the world with the pandemic, we labor under very analog, slow moving systems. What stands in the way? What's next in terms of Gemini's development um, operationally and from a compliance and regulatory vantage point? 
So um, yeah, that's a really interesting point. I think uh, some of the early rhetoric in Bitcoin was sort of like, let's kill the banks or let's disrupt like f the financial world. And, and we've always viewed uh, Bitcoin and crypto uh, writ large as really an alternative system and, and almost coexisting and working together. Um, central banks are some of the largest holders of gold in the world. So it sort of makes sense that down the road, they'll see the benefits of Bitcoin and be very large Bitcoin holders. And we're even seeing that in corporate treasury with uh, MicroStrategy, which is a publicly traded company, took a four or five hundred million dollar Bitcoin position and Square bought 50 million dollars worth of Bitcoin. So we've always viewed it as this complement or alternative. And we sort of grew up in the Wild West days and we bought some of our earliest Bitcoin on Mt. Gox, which is an exchange that famously imploded. It started as a Magic the Gathering online card exchange, pivoted into Bitcoin um, and was just uh, in over its head. And so we sort of saw a lot of this uh, and we said, look, if this is going to go mainstream, we really have to connect this really cool niche technology to the mainland of finance. Well, how do we do that? We start talking and engaging with regulators. Um, and we first started with the New York Department of Financial Services. Um, we got our trust company license. Gemini is a New York trust company. And we've spent the past year or so trying to expand our license and approvals to other jurisdictions around the world. And Singapore is one of those. And we're engaged with MAS. Um, and we really believe that you have to create sort of regulated on-ramps for this technology to, to thrive. So we're very excited about Singapore um, and the thoughtful regulation that they are promulgating. Um, and we're really excited to, to be opening there um, and obtaining a license hopefully very soon. Um, we think that that is the future because if you look at the most uh, vital um, and thriving markets in the world, they, they have some form of thoughtful regulation. Um, mm -hmm. So we felt that is important. That's been a big part of our mission. So, so Tyler, if if I can ask you maybe to opine a bit on, you know, when I when I look to Singapore and I look to the challenges the world has and the United States has, in so many ways we have to innovate our way through this crisis. Um, not to put you on the spot, but we're in the midst of a presidential transition. If you had any advice to impart to. Um, the United States and what stands in the way of really mainstreaming um, not only the regulatory posture, but the opportunities for this asset class to, for lack of a better term, come in from the shadows or come out from the shadows. Uh, what would it be? What's missing in, in your view to ensure um, we could benefit uh, collectively? Right. So um, I think just time is important. So the Bitcoin has been a retail phenomenon uh, from the beginning and crypto as a whole. We're starting to see uh, very legendary investors like Paul Tudor Jones, Stan Druckenmiller get in. Um, and so I just think more of the institutional, sophisticated, larger money coming into the play. Um, there still hasn't been, so we have an exchange that trades commodities, um, virtual commodities and Bitcoin is like gold. It's like gold 2.0. Um, we don't have the right to trade securities at the moment. Um, so just more pathways opening up with the SEC, um, more efforts in front of the CFTC, um, more people getting in the game, um, but also more regulatory certainty around the world. Like Bitcoin and crypto isn't, it's not a US or Silicon Valley phenomenon. It's a global phenomenon. In some jurisdictions, it's unclear how to, get licensed and be compliant and open an exchange. Um, in Singapore, it's very clear. In New York, in certain states, in the, in the US, it is. Um, but there's certain parts of the world where it's unclear what you need to do to do the right thing. And so I think the regulatory uncertainty makes it hard for companies like Gemini to necessarily open up, um, makes it hard for customers to get involved. Um, and overall, I think it's bad for the marketplace because then people are just sort of unregulated doing things. It becomes a wild west, which was our early experience in crypto with Mt. Gox. We bought a lot of our, our Bitcoin there. And that was really the impetus to start building Gemini. We started, to, we tried to invest in other crypto exchanges, but everybody wasn't really uh, into regulation, wanted to kind of be offshore. Um, and so at some point we said, hmm, we'll just have to, I guess we'll have to do this ourselves. 
So he picked up the phone, started talking to the regulators, say, how can we get licensed, get a piece of paper? Um, because without that, we can't get a bank account to accept customers' fiat currency um, so that they can buy crypto. So um, on a whole, regulatory certainty has gotten clearer. Um, that's for sure. Um, but it, there's still a long way to go. And so I think time, um, people, there was a time in the U.S. when it wasn't clear if Bitcoin was actually going to be you know, legal or outlawed. Um, and that was like an open question um, when we kind of first started this. Um, I don't think most people in the U.S. feel that's the case at all anymore. Um, so that, that sort of paves the way. Efforts like Gemini pave the way. Um, so I think it's just like more of, more of the same, really. I, I don't know if that's a, that's a very long-winded answer to your question. Um, but what we found is there's never, it's never really a silver bullet. You know, there isn't this one thing like, oh, um, you know, if just the regulators would say this or if some companies would say that, it tends to be a constellation of things from the private sector, from entrepreneurs, from the regulators that just all of a sudden like opens up this, this door. And sometimes it's like the Bitcoin halving or it's what's being built in DeFi. Um, and then you get these waves like 2017 and there was ones before. And I think we're upon another one now. So it's really all of it um, and just more of it and more time. Yeah. And, and it sort of one, I could relate entirely to the concept of asking for permission rather than forgiveness as the precondition of launching something that's certainly my principal preoccupation in the project that I'm helping lead. Um, but, you know, there's also this fascinating subset of opportunities that the blockchain and crypto asset space have created that are now, I think, being embraced by the public sector. We hear it and see it with something like 80% of the world's central banks contemplating central bank digital currencies. There are technology companies like Chainalysis and others that are getting billion dollar valuations on the basis of providing fundamental financial integrity and compliance services. And so I find it to be a bit of an irony that you know, when the original fears of the space were always hyperinflated and the space frankly labored under some branding and communications challenges, uh, that nonetheless, more and more people are starting to realize that blockchain-based payment systems, technologies, platforms represent potential um, quantum leaps forward in terms of financial security, uh, financial crime compliance, and the rest. And you know, I'd be curious also to get your read. I know Gemini early on with the, the trust license and others, you, you put some efforts into creating assurance models and insurance models to you know, pr put a floor underneath uh, basic custody services. Do you anticipate any other breakthroughs? What are the other, in the gold rush, what are the other tools that, that you see coming out of the space or being required um, in addition to you know, more regulatory certainty? So I think um, you make a great point. Education has always been like a big challenge and it's an ongoing thing. And in the early days, a lot of people thought that Bitcoin was uh, truly anonymous and, and used really only by illicit actors for, for illegal activity. Um, and I think what people have found out is that the blockchain is actually like, it's this open ledger um, that you can forensically Analyze, and I think recently the the United States government found a billion dollars from the Silk Road bus that they previously had not identified, and they found it through the blockchain, and they're going to auction that value off. Um, so it's really fascinating um, how the blockchain, how powerful that that ledger is. Um, but combating some of those those myths um, has been, you know, a challenge. But a lot of regulators around the world understand that. Um, and are forward thinking, including Singapore. And I think that there's uh, many dozens of companies that are trying to build um, in Singapore and get licensed. And there's going to be a very vibrant ecosystem that comes about from that. So um, I would say that, uh, so we have insurance on our, on our custody um, solution uh, to answer the, the other part of your question. Um, I think we have about $250 million and we'll scale that up as, as the commercial market sort of uh, capacity is there. Um, so it's still pretty, pretty new. There isn't billions and billions of dollars of coverage, um, but we will get there. That that's tends to be a more later stage thing in the development of markets. Uh, there is a derivatives um, uh, ecosystem that's building. So there's more ways for people to sort of express viewpoints um, around price discovery. 
Um, and I think a lot of it will just be sort of more of the same uh, for Gemini, you know, getting into more countries and more emerging markets. Uh, we tend to be mostly in the developed world today, but we think that the the promise of crypto is is very great in the developing world. Um, so we, we really look forward to trying to get to those places. And, and those are areas of the world where people are either underbanked or completely not in the banking system. And one of the exciting things about this technology is not only do we think we can do well, but we think we can do good. Uh, we think that we can be part of solving that underbanked billion plus people problem um, or moving payments and money around uh, the world, whether it's remittances or, or something else. Um, it, it's a multi-step process. We're not gonna solve that problem tomorrow. Um, just like the internet in the early days was about a hundred million users. Um, and now there's more devices than people on the planet. And it's really changed. You know, the information revolution has been astonishing. We believe that the value revolution is coming. Um, and, and we look forward to playing a part of that. Yeah. I mean, as you know, as you know, Cameron, that, that whole area of financial inclusion, financial innovation and financial integrity and not being trade-offs is a passion project. Uh, for yes. me. And, you know, and in that vein, um, you know, this question of regulation, it seems, you know, I wanted to, Tyler, I don't mean to put you on the spot of um, being our regu regulatory whisperer, but, um, you know, the Europeans are in the midst of drafting and have drafted a, a body of proposed rulemaking um, markets and crypto assets, which in my early read could be to crypto what GDPR was to privacy, right, in terms of setting a very high standard. Um, there are pros and cons with any body of law like that. I'm not sure if you've um, had a chance to contemplate it yet, but between that body of work, between the Financial Stability Board, which Singapore co-chairs along with the United States, um, coming out with some pretty strong postures of uh, regulatory requirements uh, for projects like the one I'm, I'm involved in, but, but perhaps issues that set standards for the whole industry. I'd be curious to see, you know, how you see that playing out uh, on the one hand. And on the other, you have um, projects and countries, uh, particularly China, which have, um, you know, are launching not only government-backed initiatives, but have uh, initiatives in play that support trillions of dollars in transactions and hundreds of millions of dollars of, of, uh, of uh, you know, value being transferred and people being served. Meanwhile, the West seems to be somewhat slow uh, to the table when it comes to regulatory uh, certainty for this space. And I'm curious to see how you, how you see that playing out. Well, I think regulatory certainty is, is huge um, because I can just speak from an entre entrepreneur standpoint, like, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of murky. When it's murky of like, how do we be compliant and take risks then you can't raise capital from investors because they're going to be like, wait, is this lawful what you're doing? Do you have, you know, your base is covered with licensing? Um, and that could be, you know, IP, right? Patents and all these other things, right? And that's just like a normal startup. But in crypto, crypto is sort of like this really scary word, you know, Bitcoin for a lot of people. So um, the more certainty, the better. Um, and like Cameron said, like I, I believe regulation is a spectrum. Um, there's very thoughtful regulation that sort of fosters innovation and growth. And then there's very like draconian regulation that sort of stamps it out. So you have to get a balance. Um, what we've tried to do is open a dialogue with regulators um, and try and educate them and collaborate and potentially shape the regulation because I mean, nobody like crypto is really new, right? So there isn't a roadmap. There's some uh, analogies to um, anti-money anti laundering laws um, prior to crypto, but it's also new. So I think sort of opening a dialogue and trying to shape it um, is, su is super positive. And, and just to um, add a little bit more onto that, if you think of uh, some of the famous largest technology companies in the world, uh, Apple started in a garage um, in, in Silicon Valley. Uh, I think Facebook started in a dorm room. Um, and, and I think the next, uh, crypto FinTech payments won't be coming likely out of those kind of environments. Um, and I think that's probably okay. Cause we're talking about value, but you have to be careful that overhead is not so large that a lot of people can't innovate 
in the space. And you really want to sort of right size it um, so that, you know, you don't have a five or 10 person startup carrying so much overhead that they can't really innovate. And I think that's where things like sandboxes are really helpful so that people can grow into the regulation. And there's learning on both sides. There's learning from both the startup and the regulators. And we have a really great collaborative relationship with our regulators. And I think we help each other out, figure this new thing, because nobody really has all the answers at the end of the day. We're sort of building as we go. Yeah, and it's it, it's a bit of an irony, isn't it? That, that um, you know, the, the firms and the players and the leaders such as yourselves who, uh, embraced regulation, embraced principles, and, and undoubtedly in the very early days, you both had to famously defend it against a lot of odds, uh, that now that that has become, in hindsight, a source of advantage, it's a competitive advantage in this market. Um, so, I mean, you know, hats off to, to the two of you for having been ahead of the curve. Um, I also find it interesting that you're seeing in, you know, going back to this question of central bank experimentation in this space, when the CARES Act, which mobilized $2.2 trillion initially in the US and then later $5.5 trillion of uh, effective public money uh, was first introduced, it called for the creation of a digital dollar and a corresponding digital wallet. And so there's this tension of, as entrepreneurs, how do you manage value created and value captured when so much of the technology that we're building on, including the project that I'm involved in, is open source and is effectively digital commons, right? So, you know, th there is this moment in time where you should say this ought to lower the barriers of entry. It ought to increase competition. It's it's all pro innovation and it's also compliant. Um, but you see the public sector now starting to figure out well, where is the line? Where does the line begin and end uh, for public sector involvement in this domain? Um, and I think that's going to be something we'll have to reconcile if you start to see wide adoption of CBDCs as uh, one of the many solutions that could be digitized in this in this world. Do you think that's a tension we have to reconcile or can the private sector and public sector peacefully coexist? I'd like floor. to think the latter. Um, I'd like to think the latter. We're, we're seeing that with, with NASA and SpaceX in the US, um, a lot of the space uh, innovation and exploration, it's a public private partnership. Um, and I think that there's things that the government can do that that's really hard for the private sector and vice versa. So things like the digital dollar project, um, I think I hope to see, you know, the government sort of working with these projects and people that are spearheading it and it being kind of a joint effort. Um, I think that produces really fantastic results. Um, so I don't have a ton of, you know, visibility into that, but um, I do hope that that outcome happens. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and what I, about I, your view, Tyler? Yeah, I was just going to say, like, there's there's this tendency to be very, um, for some people in community in the crypto community to be super antagonistic, like, oh, we're going to kill the banks, or you know, <laughs> Bitcoin's going to kill the dollar. But I mean, that's sort of like saying gold and the dollar are competing for the same thing. I think they're very different financial instruments. One's a good currency, that being a fiat currency, the U.S. dollar. Um, and one's a very good store of value being gold. I think they play different roles on the money spectrum. Um, and we work with banks. You know, if people want to get Bitcoin, well, their values right now, it's usually not in crypto because crypto is new. So you have to build a bridge between banks and this new world of, of crypto. Um, and you need banks to do that. So we work with a lot of banks. Um, they have a place. So I understand like people try and use provocative rhetoric to get excited, but I, I think we're all kind of working together just to build a better future, build money, make money better. Money is, I think, a technology, in my belief, a technology. It's an experiment that's been going on for thousands of years. This is just the you know, newest iteration of it. Um, and ultimately, we're trying to make a better world, we're trying to give people greater choice, independence, opportunity. Um, make people more included in the financial system, um, less permissionless. So, and I think so that I think that's what we're you know we're building towards that. And I think ultimately it's not just like us versus them. It's a little bit you know it's a collaboration. It's funny. I, I was on a panel not long ago, um, hosted by the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, and I had a colleague on the panel from the Bank for International Settlements who said, if you were going to a regulator today 
to propose uh, physical cash, it might not be approved. And I, I thought it was it was an irony to your point about it's maybe maybe it's not revolution, it's evolution of existing systems that that digital assets and cryptocurrencies represent. But I just thought it ironic that if you were going to present cash as an innovation and not necessarily a pre-existing uh, way of transferring value in the global economy, that the view of a, of a gentleman with the Bank for International Settlements is it wouldn't likely get approved because of its opacity. And then in the middle of a public health crisis, it also is the conveyor of disease, it turns out. Um, and so to me, this stuff is much more nuanced. It's about optionality and not necessarily competition with the existing systems. Um, but I, I do want to get your views on a couple of other things. You know, so far we've cast our lens around and looked at the regulatory landscape. We looked at the direction of travel from a pricing point of view and the fact that some of your, your financial predictions are vindicated, um, certainly with institutional money starting to come in. If we look internally, and you don't have to comment on Gemini, but if you look internally, a lot of times when the asset seems to fail or falter, it's for risk management 101 failures, right? You, you start a Gemini because of, uh, you know, Mount Gox, you, you have cases like Quadriga CX in Canada that are a single point of failure kind of risk management internal challenges. Um, do you feel like we're getting to a point where more and more users around the world can start to have fundamental faith in custodianship and security and cybersecurity maturity in the space? Um, do we have a long way to go yet? Or, or is this becoming standard operating procedure that there's just good discipline and good basic hygiene in place? We're definitely making progress. Um, the number of sort of bad stories um, or failures, I think, is is getting less, and I think there's more, more and more positive stories and uh, large companies like PayPal offering crypto and things like that. Um, so a lot of great developments, um, but it does take time to build trust, and that is a really big uh, principle and pillar of what we're doing at Gemini. Um, is building trust with our customers in this new asset class. Um, you know, because once people say, hey, I get it, I, I, I believe in Bitcoin, but how do I then go buy it in, in a safe manner? Um, and we're trying to demystify that and make it super simple, easy, and reliable for someone to sign up, um, download our mobile app, or go to our web interface and, and start getting involved in crypto. That's going to be an ongoing journey, uh, building and maintaining trust forever. Um, but that's, I think we are making progress. And I say we, not just us, but as an industry, um, I think we are definitely um, in, a, in a better place than we were even a couple of years ago. Absolutely. Tyler, anything to add on that um, from, from your view? Um, I think, no, I think Cameron covered it pretty well. Okay. So, you know, I agree. I mean, and I think that's the right way to, to frame it. You know, oftentimes people look at the space and they say, well, why haven't you onboarded billions of people who are unbanked or underbanked in a decade? Well, it's partly because it's still a very novel technology and partly because, you know, the, the lack of regulatory clarity in all the jurisdictions in which it can be uh, most valuable isn't, isn't in place yet. Um, so we, we don't have a ton of time left, and I, I do want to make sure, you know, that as a moderator, if I didn't cover anything that you really felt we should have covered, um, you know, the one last couple of ideas I wanted to explore really related to institutional entry. So you mentioned briefly the micro strategy example. You mentioned briefly, you know, the fact that PayPal is now supporting uh, Bitcoin and aims to support other cryptocurrencies across the space and has an enormous user base. Uh, and merchant services platforms and the rest, you know, does that augur a new world? Does this, or does it sort of make, um, you know, the last decade of effort uh, potentially for not, if in so many ways, what this space was all about was, you know, to disrupt intermediaries and to lower fundamental cost. You know, how do you, is it an asset or is it a liability that, that this is starting to go a bit more mainstream? Well, so I think, Go ahead, Karen. go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Your turn first. All right. Okay. Um, All right. Jinx. Um, so I think that, um, look, we won't build this market alone. Gemini won't, um, we'll do our best, but like, um, when, when PayPal companies like PayPal come in or Facebook talk about crypto, it demystifies it, uh, for a lot of people. So 
overall, it's a rising tide lifts all the boats. Um, micro strategy investing in Bitcoin is is very different, right? They're taking treasury funds that would otherwise be in in fiat currency, and they're worried about inflation. They're worried about the value of their their dollars uh, diminishing and degrading over time. So instead of buying gold, which they might have done 20 years ago, they're buying Bitcoin because it's hard money. And the supply of Bitcoin is fixed at 21 million. Um, there will never be more Bitcoin found or mined because that's what the, the network agrees upon. So um, that's pretty interesting. Uh, Square's also done a similar thing. They invested about 50 million. And if every company does that, and then eventually central banks do that, um, that's really huge for Bitcoin acceptance, for Bitcoin um, price, for the demand for it. So um, two different things, but but I think they're complete boons for the space. And I think that, um, you know, how people access crypto, I think, you know, it's a spectrum. Um, the same way some people buy physical gold and actually store bars of gold, um, and others choose to buy gold through an ETF, uh, a, a, you know, a wrapped uh, security, because um, they just really want the investment exposure. They're not sort of planning for the zombie apocalypse when they need their gold bars to, to you know, run away to a safe, uh, safe haven. Um, so I think it's all good. And, and I, I liken it back to sort of the, um, the AOL CD-ROM that was mailed to you know, millions of people around at least the US and maybe the world. A lot of people first got onto the internet through AOL. Um, and some people still have their AOL email addresses today, and it kind of shows that they onboarded the internet with AOL. But then a lot of people migrated into products like Gmail, and then you know a lot of messaging is done through social networks like WhatsApp, Facebook, and and that's you know a very popular thing. So I think it's a spectrum. It's all tends to be really positive. You know some of the diehard uh, Bitcoin uh, enthusiasts may self-custody their Bitcoin and not want to use a centralized regulated exchange. Uh, and, and that's totally fine. I would add that um, we're trying to make buying Bitcoin as simple as opening up a brokerage account or an online bank. Um, it just so happens that we're a crypto platform. Most people don't realize that they can, they can buy, they don't have to buy one Bitcoin. Um, so with Bitcoin hovering around 20,000, 20, you don't actually have to pony up 20,000 US dollars. You can buy a fraction, one one hundredth, you know, uh, I think a Satoshi is one one hundred millionth of, of a Bitcoin. Um, so that is something that a lot of people don't understand. And I think a lot of times people get also, they, they look at the, the price and they sort of get a, a sticker shock. But we were here three years ago, um, and so much has happened in, in this market. Facebook did not have a crypto strategy three years ago. Today, they do. Um, so at PayPal was not in the market. Um, there, there's been so many amazing developments. Um, and when, when we sort of look at that you know, 10, 20 years out um, and, and look at what's going on sort of in, with the debt and fiat regimes, um, we think it's actually a really interesting entry point, even though Bitcoin has had a tremendous year. Um, we think it's still just just the beginning, really. Well, gentlemen, it, it is a um, true delight to see the two of you again in this format. Um, thank you both for sharing not only a, a great amount of your wisdom, but fractions of it that I suspect will age quite well and we'll be able to come back hopefully at the, the next Singapore FinTech Festival, do it in person and try to work backwards and reconcile um, 2020 and, and some of the bold predictions that you both have made. Uh, in the minute or so we have left, any, any parting words for, for the listening audience? Ooh, that's good. Um, <laughs> you know, I would say, um, you know, this is, I can't give investment advice, but what I can say is pay attention to Bitcoin and crypto and educate yourself because this is the greatest money and technological revolution since the internet itself. Um, it's not a fad, it's here to stay and it will transform money, the internet and so much of the world around you and it's just starting. Um, so don't write it off. Um, you know, I think I, I personally find when I invest in something, even a little bit, it focuses me to learn more about it. 
Um, I get more serious and disciplined. Um, but you don't have to do that. You can also just just learn about it. Um, I think it's it's super fascinating, and I feel grateful to be able to dedicate every day to working towards it and building a better world with it. Here, here. Yeah, I think that's that's super well said. Um, I think if if I could go back to the late '90s of the internet, knowing what I know today, you know, how would I? What would I have done at that at that point? Of course, I was finishing up high school, so I wasn't really in a position to to invest uh, in the next, you know, that 25 years of growth. But I think we're at one of those moments today in crypto. Um, it's still late 90s, uh, maybe, you know, early 2000s. And then I think you have to ask yourself, like, how am I going to approach the next 25 years of this amazing revolution? Well, grateful to two titans of the industry and to the platform you're building. We have common cause in so many domains. So wonderful to share the stage with you. Thanks. Thank you. And we are grateful to Dante, Cameron, and Tyler for letting us in on their conversation about cryptocurrencies. What about you after listening? Did it change your opinions of cryptocurrencies? Well, if you're still not convinced about cryptocurrency as an investment for you. Our next session aims to help you understand what place digital currencies may have in the future.